Hi everybody, Keith Tanner here from Flying Miata, and today we're going to be having a little technical talk about suspension stuff, specifically bump steer. Now if you enjoy this sort of content, don't forget to um, check out our YouTube channel, um, all of our social media stuff. We post technical information, information on our products, that sort of thing all the time. So you know the usual deal, like, comment, subscribe. There's at least one video a week, and we try to make sure that they're all actually informative instead of just influencer hijinks. So there you go. Today we're going to talk, as I said, about bump steer. And the first thing I need to do is define what bump steer is, because it's used for a couple of different things, one of which is in, used incorrectly, one of which is used correctly. The incorrect definition of bump steer, which a lot of people will use, is basically steering kickback. That's you're driving along, one wheel hits a bump, and it pulls the wheel to one side. If you're running very low offset wheels, for example, you push the wheels out as far as possible, you've probably experienced that quite a bit. It's got to do with scrub radius, all sorts of interesting stuff in that area, but that's not today. Today what we're talking about is the change in tow with suspension travel. So as the wheels move through the suspension, do they, do they tow in, do they tow out, or do they not move at all? That's the bump steer. It's the amount of steering change that happens when you hit a bump. Um, it happens both front and rear, actually. The Miatas, all generations of Miatas, have some interesting stuff going on in the back with, re with regards to what the we rear wheels are doing. The earlier cars, the NAs and MBs, had differential bushing durometers that, made, that had some self-steering in the rear end. Um, the NCs use a multi-link suspension that does a little bit of interesting steering. They almost, they, they almost uh, if I remember correctly, they, they tow out slightly when you enter a turn to sort of make it a very sharp front end. The NDs go the other way for more stability. Interesting choices on the part of Mazda's designers. But we're not interested in that today because we can't really do anything about it. We're going to talk about what's in the front, why there are bump steer kits, what bump steer is, how it affects your car, and why should you care. Let me make sure I'm covering my notes here. So, yeah. So you can, you can sort of understand what I'm talking about, hopefully, about what's going on with bump steer. You know, when wheels hits the bumps, they may go toe out, they may go toe in, or they might stay where they are. And it's got to do with the geometry of the front end. And the parts I'm going to talk about, if you want to come over here, Travis, the parts I'm going to be talking about, it involves the geometry of the knuckle, it involves the geometry of the upper control arm, the lower control arm, the steering rack placement, the subframe, and the tie rod, and how that's all connected. These are all the bits and pieces that are involved in controlling bump steer in terms of determining what the bump steer looks like, but we can do very little about some of them. We're not going to be changing the shape of the knuckle, generally speaking. We're not going to be changing the shape of the subframe, generally speaking. Um, so we're going to concentrate on the stuff that we can adjust, and most of that is the tie rod. Well, I'm going to show you some diagrams here. This is the idealized world. Got an upper control arm. So this is the subframe size. This is the car. Upper control arm goes something like this. Lower control arm goes something like this. And they're not, these two points are not, well, this should actually be a little further back. There we go. These two points are not directly on top of one another. These dimensions are chosen partly to make sure you get the right camber gain when you hit a bump so that the wheel will actually, you know, turn, pull in at the top um, so that when you're cornering, you get more grip, that sort of thing. So when these move up and down, there's uh, the, the wheel stuck on the end, the wheel is here, uh, is, is moving up and down. And you've got a tie rod, which is what controls your actual steering. And that tie rod, if it effectively changes length, it's going to you know, change length relative to where these points are. If it arc moves in a different arc, it will affect the toe. So ideally, you actually want it to match the lower control arm, or I suppose the upper if you've got, you know, depending on how you built the Miata, want to, to match the lower control arm as much as possible. Now I'm going to get into some of the overall geometry here. Oh, I've got a line that joins these two. Got a line that joins these two. So this is determined by the subframe, and these are in completely the wrong place for a Miata, but whatever. Um, this is determined by the knuckle. Then there's what's called an instant center, which is what happens if you extend these, these lines, you end up with what's called the instant center up there. This is just suspension geometry stuff, but it is important because it determines how things move. And your tie rod needs to be, it needs to have one end on this line, went on this line, and it needs to also line up with that instant center, which it won't in this example. <laughs> um, it should line up with that instant center as well. In this case, it doesn't. We have a problem. So 
this particular setup would have a problem when this when your car hits a bump this moves up the geometry of these will move this way this will move in a different way it's going to end up it's going to arc in a different way it'll actually in this case probably tow out um, but this is the thing that we need to play with the Miata is pretty good overall if you actually look in here you can see that that ideal situation of having the the tie rod lined up with the lower control arm is pretty darn close because the pivot point is it's just in here I'm not sure exactly where it is in there. Depends on how this has been assembled. But it's pretty close to the pivot point on the lower control arm. And then out here, the pivot point's a little bit higher. Mazda decided to put this, to put the steering arm a little higher. There's a pivot point for the lower control arm. There's a pivot point for the tie rod. You do want, for stability, a little bit of, which shall we call it, bump out is okay. So it goes slightly toe out on bump. Because that means when you go into a corner, the car rolls, the front wheel sort of steers out a little bit more. It makes it a little more stable. If you have bump in, which the, the front wheel steers in, it means when you go into a corner, you set the wheel, the car rolls, and it starts turning more. It's a very unstable sort of situation. You generally want to avoid that. Um, if you have bump out in a straight line and you hit a bump, it's going to make that wheel toe out, try to pull you in one direction. Generally speaking, we try to keep the bump as close to zero as possible, the bump steer. And that's, I mean, Mazda did a pretty good job on that. The problem is, is just the way the geometry works when you're dealing with actual linkages and stuff like this. You may end up with, let's say if we charted, let's see. We charted, say, suspension movement. Make sure I get the axes right on this. Um, we'll say suspension movement here. So this is the amount of suspension movement up and down. So up and down. And this will be our toe change. So that's our in and out change. We want this to be pretty much straight. That's ideal. No change in tow with suspension movement. I'll do it in black so it's more. In reality, what it really looks like is it'll be something like this. We I mean, could go either way, it could go this way, it could go that way, but generally you've got a big sweet spot in the middle and then near the ends things start going squirrely. That is the nature of, <laughs> of mechanisms, unfortunately. They tend to get a little weird near their extremes. So the entire reason you see bump steer correction kits or anything to do with bump steer is because somewhere in here is our normal static ride height. It's where the car sits when you just drop it on the ground and then with the bump steer happens front and back with that. If we change the static ride height, we lower the car, we end up closer to one end of this curve than the other. And we may want to adjust it a little bit to make sure that we don't hit those extremes more often. Make it a little more squirrely, come in the corners, that sort of thing. Do we have any questions going on there yet, Mike? No. Okay. So that's where we come into things like the R package, lower or um, tie rod end. This was introduced by Mazda with the 93 LE Miata and used on the R package cars from 94 to 97, which sat a little bit lower than all the other ones. And it's this is a standard one. This is an R package. It's really hard to see the difference. It's about five millimeters, but it sits very slightly lower if you put everything together. You probably, I'm probably holding this completely wrong, but you generally get the idea. The dimensions, it's basically pushed its pivot point down very slightly. And the reason for that is because at that slightly lower ride height, that makes the bump steer curves come in in a happier place for that lower ride height. So that's why Flying Miata sells them, because they work very well with our springs, for example. If you are concerned about bump steer, this is an easy replacement of a consumable part. So there you go, Mazda factory. Uh, with the NB, Mazda changed a bunch of stuff. We all think of them as being basically the same suspension, but they actually changed a few things. They dropped, the, well, I'll do, it on, I'll do it over here. They dropped the lower control arm mounting points a little bit. They moved this up. They moved the steering arm, so that's the steering arm here. They moved it up a little bit, and there was a change here, and I forget, I think it moved this point up as well. So you can see that the, the instant center moved all over the place. The roll center dropped down, which is part of what they're aiming for. Um, I'm not going to get into that today. But it does mean that if you mix and match parts, you can get yourself in something, in some odd behavior roll center wise. Or is it roll center wise? Uh, well, yes, but bump steer wise. Luckily, it turns out that as long as you keep the parts more or less of the same generation, this R package um, tie rod end has much the same effect. On a slightly lowered car, this brings the bump steer fairly straight, as consistent as possible, and in a good range for. A normal street car. There are lots of bump steer kits on the market right now. Um, 
you know, the, the drifting community seems to have adopted bump steer kits probably because it came from something like a, a 240SX or something. A lot of what's in the drift community came from other platforms, but you tend to see bump steer or correction kits there that may involve something like a rod end like this one to replace the factory piece. And then you just stack up spacers, makes it infinitely adjustable. The problem is, as you can see with this, these things aren't straight. See, there's a little bit of an angle on that thing. And if I set this up so it's got the same angle on it, I'm just about at the maximum point of adjustment on this, uh, on this rod end. I can't really add much, which means the suspension droops. That's going to run out of travel. That's going to start bending things. Uh, things will start breaking. I would stay away from these, never mind the fact that the way they wear. So generally speaking, you want a ball joint at the end there. So what you're doing when you're, when you're doing this, I'll see if I can recover some of my diagram here. So in this particular case, um, I have a problem in that my, I'm not anywhere near meeting up with that instant center. I'm going to move this up so it looks a little closer. There we go. Now we're pretty good. I'm faking this. It's okay. <laughs> That's supposed to be a straight line. Um, what you're doing when you are, uh, when you are using this R package ball joint is you're moving this down a little bit and that will, you know, change the location of this compared to the instant center. You can also space the rack up and down, which has the exact same effect. If you space the rack up, then that means at this point, which is the inside of the tie rod attached to the steering rack, will do the same thing and it will have the same effect effectively as putting on this IR package piece. So if you do lower a car, that is another option is you, could, you can lift the uh, steering rack up a little bit instead of changing out the, um, the tie rod end. I like the tie rod end option because I've had steering racks come loose on the track, didn't enjoy it very much. And this is a Mazda factory OE engineered part. I have a lot of trust in these. So generally speaking, this is my first choice. Not as sexy, maybe. Now, do we have a question, Mike? We have a question. Can't, the question is, can you do too many bump steer correcting items? And for this, I'm going to talk about how you measure bump steer. So thank you for that segue, Mike. It's perfect. You can measure bump steer on your car. You can't do anything about a bunch of this stuff. I mean, you're not going to be moving around the the pivot points on the knuckle. This is a steering knuckle for those who don't recognize it. It's the other side of the car. Um, but this is your lower pivot point. This is your upper pivot point, or it's the ball joint just above it. And this is the steering arm. You can't really do much about these. I mean, in extreme cases, you can start heating these up, bending them around. We're not looking for that right now. We're looking for bolt-ons. So how can you tell where you are in your bump steer? And this is where it's kind of fun to just experiment with stuff, to play with things, to look at your car and play with it. You can make your own bump steer gauge to test at home. Long Acre will sell you one. Um, there's a bunch of stuff on the market, but I have, I didn't get a chance today to make one for you, but I made a mock-up. You will need a dial indicator, which is basically just a very accurate measuring device that will tell you, you know, to thousands of an inch or pieces of millimeters. That's exactly the movement you've got going on. You need a couple of big boards. This is a scale replica of big boards. Um, and you'll want a third one that you'll, you can use to put a plate on here, although you can do it with a wheel if you do it the right way. So basically what you want to be able to do is move the suspension through its travel and then measure the toe change. So the way you do that, you take your two boards. This can be a piano hinge instead of a piece of duct tape because I had a piece of duct tape. Um, and you put a bolt on here that sticks out a little bit. And then you stick this through on the other side and just lean it up against whatever it is you're measuring. The best way to do this is to, yeah, I'll show this, I'll explain this further in a moment. The best way to do this is to build a plate that goes across here and gives you a nice flat surface to measure on. And then you can also mark where up and down, up and down, or you can even measure right off the, uh, off the rotor if you're really good at making, at, at measuring some other things. But effectively what we want to do is this part will ride against one side of it. And then this will show the movement. This, this, uh, this side will be set and this will show the change in the movement. So that would be your toe change. And you don't really want this thing moving at all, but if you see it start moving in and out, that means that you are seeing toe variation. I'm not sure if anybody followed that, but that's the general idea. So on this thing, if you were gonna make a plate to go on here, you'd need a hole for, this, for the hub. You'd need four holes for the, the lugs. And then what I would do is I would probably mark the center to make sure I had got the centered, and then just put a scale on here And then you start moving the suspension up and down. The scale tells you, this is your measurement, you know, for every millimeter, inch, quarter inch, 
a centimeter. You're probably going to want to do say five centimeter or five millimeter increments or so. Um, you just mark out on each of those what the reading on that uh, on the dial indicator is, and then you just graph them up like this. Then you make your change and you do it again. Now you have to do this without the spring and without the uh, sway bar. Luckily, Miata's being double wishbone suspension cars, you can just take out the whole spring shock assembly. And I was too lazy to set this up for you, but that's how we would do it here. We'd just put a jack underneath here, a transmission jack for something, and just move this up and down and then check to see how much it changes as it goes through. And then you can do something like just put some washers underneath your steering rack, move it up and down and see did it get worse or better. And worse or better is defined by basically amount of change, but also directive change. You want to avoid that toe in situation if you can on, on, uh, on compression. Um, but generally speaking, you, you don't want them moving much at all because that will be the most stable, the most consistent behavior. Do you have any more questions, Mike? Yeah. Um, regarding the testing procedure, would it be ideal to test the rough rate right height and then kind of range up and down? So the question is for the testing procedure, should you start at right height and range up and down? And basically, yes, you want to, you want to make sure that you are testing both sides of your static right height. Um, I mean, it's something that's not going to change the entire range. So ideally, you'd want to change the, the whole, you'd want to test the whole thing if you can, but the most important part of it is going to be effectively uh, your standard ride height and more compression up, you know, wheel going up, car going down, whatever you want to look at it. That's going to be the more important part that you're looking for um, because that's what you're going to experience when you go into a turn. For example, your, your outside suspension compresses, and then what does that wheel do? Does it tow in? and make you want to spin? Does it tow out and make things a little more stable because you can always put just a little bit more? Or does it stay for fairly consistent and predictable? What you don't want is something that goes behavior, behavior is normal, and all of a sudden it does something weird. You don't want that, that radical change, and that's why you start moving things around to make sure that your standard ride height to you know, sort of your maximum bump, you start to minimize the weirdness that happens near the ends and keep it as consistent as possible through as much of the range as possible. Is that good? Any more questions? Okay, I think that's actually most of it. Um, one of the questions we had is, can you affect this by alignment changes? And you can't, unfortunately. Alignment changes will move, it'll move these points in and out very slightly. Uh, I mean, this is the lower control arm again, that's your, that's the car side, so this is your, your, adjust, your alignment adjusters are on here. It'll move this in and out very slightly. Can't really do much about that. Um, you, you effectively will make up for that by changing the, you know, by adjusting the tie rod so that you've got zero toes whenever. So alignment really doesn't have much effect on this. Although if you really want to be setting things up as tightly as possible, you'll want to make sure the car is fully aligned, set it as normal ride height, and then do your, your testing from there. Um, I have built my own testing gauges in the past. I just don't have them anymore. This was back 2005 or so, I think was the last time I was messing around with it when I was doing a home built car. So they're for, because they're so easy to replicate, three pieces of wood, uh, make sure they're not warped because that will just give you nothing but headaches. Um, three pieces of wood or you can get milled aluminum, that sort of thing, uh, and a piano hinge and a dial indicator is pretty much all you need. I will, if there are lots and lots of questions and people are very confused about what this has looked like, maybe I can put one together sometime in the future um, or, you know, put up some, some drawings. But effectively all it is is just a piece of wood as a base because you don't want this moving around, because as soon as this moves, you've lost, it, you've lost your reference. So a piece of wood as a base, something to lean against your measurement board, and then the dial indicator, something to follow it, and the dial indicator, and the dial indicator is telling you everything. You can do it with two dial indicators, but then you have to get into math. You have to start subtracting the difference between them. What's the point? A piece of, just a bolt on the other side will do the job just fine. So that will test your change in, your change in tow as it goes up and down. So no more questions, Mike? No more questions. All right, so that's all we've got right now. If you do have questions, I should have asked you this beforehand, put them in the comments, too late for that. If you do have questions and you're watching this in the future, not live, put them in the comments. We'll do our best to answer them. Uh, we wanna make sure people understand what this is so they know, you know, it's another thing to know about your car, another thing to know about setup. And just, it's always fun to know what's behind your handling. So if you like this sort of stuff, again, subscribe to our uh, channels, comment, uh, like it, you know, all this, you know, all that stuff. I'm too old for social media, but that's it for today. <laughs> My name is Keith Tanner from Fly Miata. Thanks for your attention.